this is why can we hear this can we hear me now that's better yes so sorry <laughs> what's what's step number one on zoom unmute the microphone that's where we're at <laughs> Please forgive me. it's too easy i was just saying all sorts of things so let's review shall we welcome everyone thank you so much i'm so sorry about my technical difficulties uh but we'll get better as we practice more that's what this whole pandemic is teaching us i think uh but i'd like to welcome our guests here today and thank you all for coming um Thank you to our guests and thank you to everyone who's here to um, watch and ask questions because we're excited to hear more about it. So at, to review, we just heard a wonderful presentation by Dr. Bianca Jackson and Professor Gregory Gardner, both from Norfolk State University. So we'd like to say hello and welcome to them. Thank you. And uh, we also want to say hello to Dr. Eric Crawford of Coastal Carolina University. Uh, who spoke last night also on the history of spirituals, but from a, the perspective of a musicologist and researcher. So welcome, Dr. G Crawford. And we have Dr. Lori Hicks here. She, we'll hear more from her later in this uh, present uh, this week of workshops. Uh, Dr. Hicks will be giving a presentation uh, that she'll tell us more about about teaching young black singers and her own um, personal history as a singer, teacher, composer, performer, and everything else that she does. So thank you. Welcome, Dr. Hicks. Um, and we also want to welcome Dr. Tommy Watson, uh, who is joining us and has an extensive experience as a teacher and performer and is a teacher at Anderson University. So welcome, Tommy, Dr. Watson, so good to see you. Thank you all to, for joining us. Um, I think what might be a good thing to get us started is to discuss briefly, I know we could go on for a long time about this, but I'm gonna ask our panelists if we would uh, just give a little a review about their personal history with singing spirituals and learning about them um, in their life. Uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Hicks, if you don't mind. Yes, hello everyone. Dr. Lori Hicks here and spirituals has always been a part of my musical upbringing. Um, the church I grew up in, Old Grove AME Church in Detroit, Michigan. Um, we would sing anthems and spirituals as well as gospel. So we kind of sang some of everything. And then the high school I went to say, sang a lot of arranged spirituals, Moses Hogan um, and, and uh, pieces like like that. Um, and then right on into college, I went to a historically black college called Kentucky State University, where I am currently the department chair. And uh, we toured all over and our concert concerts would be um, mostly spirituals and arranged spirituals. We also had um, young composers, commissions and uh, uh, spiritual works that we would premiere. Um, and then I use spirituals all the time as a soloist, as well as teaching with my students. Spirituals for me, especially the burly spirituals, are like the 24 hits that everybody assigns. So those are my go-to for my beginner singers. And um, I arrange spirituals. So as a composer, my um, favorite medium or my favorite um, a part of or type of arranging is concert spiritual or choral arrangements. And I do spiritual workshops. I teach um, how to uh, perform masterclass and as well as how to research spirituals. And I think that's it. So spirituals, you call me the spiritual lady if you want to. Yeah, <laughs> it's a big part of my, my musical development and a huge passion of mine. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, let's go to uh, Dr. Jackson. Do you mind giving us a discussion of your history? Sure, yes. Thank you for having me once again. So my story is similar to Dr. Hicks's story. Spirituals pretty much have been with me since birth. Uh, my mother is, um, a, a, in, during the time when I was growing up, she was a local gospel singer and she actually toured and performed uh, a set of spirituals with a performance group that went around like reenacting the stories behind the spirituals. And I, as a little kid, sat watching these spirituals, not knowing that one day I also would be performing them. So I performed also through high school and college and also an HBCU, Tougaloo College in Mississippi, where spirituals were pretty much like the, the meat and potatoes of our repertoire. So I learned spirituals right along with art songs, 
Beyonce and Aria, uh, and just everything. Moving on to now, I perform spirituals right alongside my uh, my opera arias. So I'm pretty much very heavy in classical repertoire, like operatic, but I also always have spirituals right there with me. Um, so they're very near and dear to my heart. So as a Mississippian, spirituals are very deep uh, within my soul. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you so much. And uh, Gregory Gardner, do you mind? Not at all. Um, I started, uh, well, was introduced to spirituals uh, like the others in the, in the Black church. I was raised in a Baptist church and I would hear spiritual song and as well as anthems. So it wasn't just just spirituals uh, and, and not so much gospel in the church that I uh, that I grew up in. And I went to high school. I went to a, well, what would be called an integrated high school. It was I might have been one of ten blacks at the at the high school um, here in Virginia, and the, and that uh, that concert choir at the high school uh, sang spirituals. Sometimes I would get chosen as a soloist. Uh, for the spirituals. And then I went on to uh, Howard University. And I tell you, when uh, we heard, uh, when you were a freshman, you were not able to sing in the concert choir, but we were invited to come to their rehearsal to hear them and to hear those people sing those spirituals, it would just raise you up out of your seat. Uh, the beauty of, of those of those melodies and the, the beautiful quality of the tone of those singers. There was just nothing like it. And back in those days, um, uh, the many of the uh, uh, professors at Howard would try to make us sound more European. Uh, so that was a thing then. And as a matter of fact, you would you were you could get suspended or uh, put out of Howard if you got caught in the practice room uh, uh, performing gospel music or jazz or anything like that. But you could you could do spirituals, but not not jazz. And then I uh, after I, I left Howard University, I I lived in New York for many many years, and that's where at that concert, that Carnegie Hall concert that uh, that. Um, Jesse and Kathy did. I was there at that uh, concert and I met Marian Anderson and was just able to shake her hand. I felt uh, just uh, lifted up off the ground just meeting her. And also one of the major people in my life that I met at Howard University was this vocal coach named Sylvia Olden Lee. She taught at Curtis uh, Institute and other, I see uh, Lori shaking her head. L everybody who sings just about, uh, especially African-American singers, knew Sylvia Lee and, and William Warfield, but I met her. She would come to my home. She would coach me all the time on spirituals. And, uh, and she's one of the, I sang at her funeral, as a matter of fact, in Philadelphia. And, uh, and so she was one of the major influences on me in terms of seeing the spirituals. And also while I was at Howard, I, I was introduced to um, a recording of Shirley Verrett doing her Carnegie Hall recital, which was in 1965. That was before I went to college, but, uh, but that her singing Old Glory and uh, Witness, those spirituals, I mean, she, did, she just blew me away just to, to hear. And then I got to hear her at Con Constitution Hall while I was a student at Howard. And then later on at, in New York, I got to hear her and Leontine Price uh, in concert. So that's my story. That's wonderful. And I, and I still, by the way, I still sing spirituals, you know, in, in public performances, recitals, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> That's really great. Um, forgive me as I'm flashing pictures around too. I'm trying to get that organized. So hopefully uh, we have that in a better format now. Uh, Tommy, did we hear from you? Can I, uh, can you say hello and talk about your experience too? Okay. Hello. Uh, and thank you all for having me here. 
Um, I grew up, as everyone else did, um, in the church. I, like uh, Lori, grew up AME. And so we were very much high church. And so we sang spirituals, we sang hymns, and we sang anthems. And that was it. Nothing else was allowed. I mean, they were very serious about this. And so the first time I ever had the opportunity to, uh, to experience gospel music truly was in college. And I happened to not be a part of the gospel choir, but I went to every concert that they always had. And so uh, growing up in the church, I had that particular experience. And I remember being in high school, uh, just about to graduate from high school. It was the first time I ever had a choral experience where we actually sang spirituals. And um, it was with uh, all state chorus. And I, I brought my music home and I was singing. And so my grandmother comes in, my mother's mother comes in and she turns around the corner and she says, what are you singing? And I said, this is a, a song for a school. And she says, that takes me back so very far. So she began to tell me stories about this particular song when she heard the song first and um, the songs that her mother used to sing and so forth and so on. And so I went to college and I continued to study and I studied the spirituals um, a little bit less than I did with the classical, uh, with spirituals, uh, it's classical too, but I just happened to be that way. And so um, I did have the opportunity um, uh, when I was at the governor's school here to study with Uncle Bill. I think everyone has studied with Uncle Bill. And so I had the opportunity to work with those, William Warfield. And so I had the opportunity to work on spirituals with him and also you know, some appropriate songs for my, you know, at the time of Porgy and Bess. And of course, I, I continued to uh, use them in performance and concert, et cetera. And I happened to not teach at the HBCU, but all of my students um, at some point in their time at the university level have all song spirituals. And I usually teach them the dialect that we use back at home um, to sing these spirituals. And so this semester just happens to be that about, uh, about three quarters of them have them. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. And they are too. And so I love to pass on this tradition. I love to give them the opportunity to be able to explore something that's new and something that will be um, possibly meaningful uh, to them in a unique kind of way. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tommy. That's really in cool to learn and to hear um, perspective as well. Um, and I think Dr. Crawford, did we get to you at the beginning? I think it Whoops, sorry, I muted. Yeah, no, no. Okay, great. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. Will you tell us your experience too? Right. I uh, went to an HBCU, a Norfolk State. You hold the green and gold. And um, um, I was in the a concert choir, and of course, a spiritual was already a staple there. It, it wasn't though until 2007 at a, a master's student, Mary, Mary Ann Smalls, and her uh, mother is um, Malina Small. Yeah, famous actress. I realized that the songs that I had heard as a kid in the, in the old church um, came from a location that I knew nothing of. I even said, is that Gula? What is that? Uh, if I know the trouble I've had, yeah. it could be Jesus and the awareness of that. And so I, I decided to try and drive down to St. Helena Island, which is in Beaufort County, which is about an hour or so from uh, Charleston. I remember the first time driving here, I got lost and I saw these trees and I was scared to death. But I finally got to St. Helena Island and I, and I went there and I, and I ended up in the old praise house, a little small structure. And I heard Deacon James Garfield Smalls sing. It was there that my cultural memory went back to being a small kid. I realized there, and, and I could hear the slave ancestors thinking to me. He learned his songs from his grandmother. He died this past year at 800 years old. He was probably 89 then. As he sang these songs in this Gullah language, this West African language, and the beat that like, started to be in and was stomping, I knew I had come home. And to me, I was already in Africa. Wow, wonderful. Uh, it's nice to hear that you all each have personal connections that really uh, resonate deeper than what we uh, necessarily can articulate or, or, 
or know that it, that there's something it seems that is deeper in your your bones in your soul about this which is a beautiful thing um I was wondering, I have written down a few things and I'm hoping that people here will also contribute to questions as well as our panelists. Um, but I'm wondering, I was fascinated by uh, Dr. Jackson and Professor Gardner's comment about rhythm being the most important element of this style of music. And I wonder if you think of that with regard to other, other elements of music as far as a hierarchy of what is and what isn't more important and if you would speak to that a little bit, because um, I think I'm getting somewhere with regard to style as well, too, because you can approach these from a sim more simple format, unadorned melody, and then you can start adding lots of bells and whistles and um, uh, decorations to the melody as well. But I wonder if somebody would want to address this topic about the hierarchy of the elements of music as far as what's most important with the performance of a spiritual. <laughs> yeah, I thought she was going to go to you guys first. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd love to jump in if nobody um, wants to start. But with um, understanding the history of you know Africans and how they used rhythm and how they used percussion and percussion instruments to communicate, how they used um, you know, they used drum circles and they had lots of communal um, types of of uh, engagements and the percussion, the rhythm, the beats were at the heart and the center of all of that. Um, and how that transferred into the the singing of it, because of course, when they were brought here, you couldn't play the instruments, you couldn't um, sing in your own, you couldn't use your own language. So then um, understanding how they came to uh, interpolate it into a vocal form, into a form that they were allowed to uh, express, um, it, it really is innovation at its finest, really. And to use all those things and to still be able to communicate with each other without the uh, superiors understanding what you're talking about and knowing the messages that were going back and forth. Uh, so it was really all interwoven together. And um, it, uh, to your other question about, you know, having a standard style and then all the bells and whistles, um, and we we can definitely open that conversation up some more because I think it is a, a common misconception to be able to, yes, the spiritual is a folk song, but the kind of concert spirituals and arranged spirituals that we have in our canon, in our repertoire, um, really are meant to be approached as art song and um, not, you know, uh, it's not gospel, it's not jazz or blues, it's the precursor too. Um, so I kind of, I equate it to, um, you know, they weren't, they were only allowed to express themselves so much on the plantation or so much as slaves. So yes, in its original form, you would have gotten embellishment, you would have gotten improvisation, but um, the the arrangers, I we know, and, and they say for themselves, you know, it is to be performed as is. And if, if there are room for ad libs and they would write those things in. So then the, the improv or that the soul of the music is in the rhythm. The soul of the music is in um, the color of the voice, is in in, you know, the articulation of the dialect. You don't have to add all the bells and whistles to get the uh, the depth of the the music and the meaning of it. So um, it it, it kind of, you know, evolved, of course, into other things, but um, really adhering to if you're going to do a concert or arrange spiritual, then yes, treating it like an art song in its purest form. If you're doing it as a hymn, then I tell my students, okay, yeah, but the melodies and the words have to be, you know, uh, paramount, have to be prominent. So yes, you can add some things if you're doing it in the, in the folk form, but still there was only so much that um, you would have, they would have been able to express uh, as slaves. I'd like to jump in if I could to, um, to say that uh, rhythm, I believe is, is quite important. But uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that these spirituals embody the inner life of these enslaved people. And so the words, uh, the only way that they were free was in their imaginations. 
And so the only way that they could bring that forward is, is through, through these songs. And the songs were, of course, uh, um, I think with any kind of song, the, the most important thing, my, at least this is what my teacher, who I ha whom uh, I have a picture of, of on the wall here, but one of the things that he would tell me that is the most important in any song is the word. The, is the, like the, uh, the Bible says that uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word is, is what's important. And if you can sing, infuse these spirituals, with the inter interiority of these people who were only free in their imagination. That's all they could, they could sing about going over the Jordan and they could sing about going to heaven. And they could also say in those words that everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. And they were talking about some of these slave masters. They talked about heaven, but they said they ain't going there. And so you, there's all of that. There's all of that. But I think the words have to be paramount. The, it, the, of course, the rhythm, uh, the rhythm oftentimes follow the words. So that's, that's my thought on that. If you think about it, they spoke very percussively as well. The, the right. languages that um, the way Africans spoke was very percussive as well. So it all translates into the language as well. But yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. And I'd just like to jump into it and say that uh, it's not supposed to be overly complicated because you have to keep in mind what an average day may have been like for you know our enslaved ancestors. And so they really didn't have the opportunity to be quite fancy, uh, if you will. It was very, very simple, very heartfelt. And the words, the rhythms actually is what uh, really projects the power of these pieces from my perspective anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they had to sing them while they worked. You know? Yes. Yeah, yes. they had to sing them while they worked, and, the, and that rhythm is in there as well. So, no, it, it couldn't be too complicated. They had to. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, several master classes with Roland Carter. He he takes choirs through. He has them, you know, do that kind of rhythm and feel it in their bodies. And and just about every spiritual you, they come, you come across, it has that work pulse that <clears throat> behind it. So it's just this innate rhythm in there when i when i was at howard um the the choral, the choral director there um evelyn white she would get us you to get to get in a circle and do what eric crawford was talking about last night that circle well we didn't shout but she would make us walk around in a circle doing that circle dance, especially on something like Don Me My Va, and shuffling your faith, the Lord, and I never will turn back. Oh, I will go. And and then what she would do is make us stop going around in the circle and have the same feeling standing up in place and, and have that same feeling the same inner kind of uh, pendulum, that uh, that inner inner rhythm. Yeah, yeah. I've been sitting here, if I could add, um, digesting. You know, we learned during our seminars about pedagogy and teaching that sometimes you have to give the student time to digest. So I've been just digesting, and I agree with everything that my colleagues have said. And so... Um, I guess, Jill, I would think that in agreement with everything that's been said previously, also looking at what is the intent behind what is trying to be conveyed at that time. So the communication of what you're trying to get across. So at one point, it may be rhythm. At another point, because you know you have groans and shouts that may not have any words at all, or just a hum that can be a part of spirituals that have no words at at all but it still has a meaning behind it so when I think back to like African culture and the idea that life is art and art is life then the meaning can shift because the song and whatever musical device we're using is really flexible and customizable to what you are feeling and what you are trying to connect at that moment that's a good point I, I, I like that yeah, I, I was hearing something recently. I think it was a, that panel I went to listen to you at, uh, Lori, 
um where was that three on three spiritual panel in new york yeah yeah and i was fascinated with that that idea that well here it is a spiritual or or a classical art song but if you add too much it shifts into another genre or another style of music and um that's one of the most beautiful things about music is that it can shift and like water between different styles and i wonder if if that's something you dr hicks as a composer think about as far as i want this to be this style of a, a the, an approach of an arrangement of this spiritual versus another or i want a little bit of this here and there um and i wondered if you wanted to talk about that as a composer from that perspective sure <laughs> well um with with my compositions i really am I'm, I'm a big text painter so um i love to keep it in the concert style and i i love being able to add to that canon of repertoire uh for you know vocalists and choirs to be able to perform um I, I'll slide little things in, in the accompaniment <laughs> and you might hear uh, a, a little motive uh, quoting something else. Um, you might hear a little gospel motive. Um, there's a, there is a, another piece that I haven't published it or anything, but I took, um, uh, oh gosh, Chopin, Chopin's piece and put sometimes I feel like a motherless child on top of it. Um, to kind of show that that layer of how the spiritual runs through everything that that music really runs through um, all kinds of music. Um, but I really try to keep in it with a specific style. And then if I'm doing a, an arranged gospel or an arranged hymn, I'll kind of teeter back and forth. But um, when I'm doing the spiritual, I did, I, I was commissioned with by the Negro Spiritual Scholarship Foundation and they asked me for the I Want to Die Easy, which is probably my most popular piece. And with that, I, I first of all, I didn't like it at first. I'm like, I've, I've never heard the spiritual and I didn't really even know where to start, but I started listening to it, it in its purest form with the banjo and how they were singing it a cappella and all these things. So I started to feel the rhythm of, of how it was expressed naturally. And then I wanted to, I, I interpolated that into the accompaniment and really tried to provide that natural, you know, um, that natural uh, ah, color um, to the piece. And, and there are some parts where I, I tried to write as if it were a banjo playing along with um with the voice and yeah so i i really try to stick to kind of the concert art form art song form uh when i am arranging but you'll hear little hints little hints here and there don't go too far though don't go too far <laughs> delicious can, can i just say too that yeah. um you know i think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the spirituals in, in terms of American music is the beginning of it all. And it leads to the blues, which leads to jazz, which leads to uh, gospel, to what? gospel then Big to band, R &B, rock and roll, then to rock and roll, and then to hip hop. Country, so hip hop. Elements of it, all funk, the, grunge. Through all of yeah. it, yes. Disco, yeah, yeah yes. so all of it. It's all, all in there. And it's only been within the last 30 or 40 years, or I would say since the 80s or so, that um, contemporary uh, commercial music has been seen as being a legitimate art form because it came from our community. Right. And that's the reason why it has been seen as such. But right. now it's gaining more popularity. So now you see more programs that have, you know, like CCM, like MT or whatever, stuff like Berkeley. But, you know, 70 years ago, that would never have been an issue. That, would, that never would have happened. Yeah. Uh, Adolphus Hailstark is a local composer in these parts. He's at Old Dominion U University. He taught for about 20 years here at Norfolk State. But uh, and Eric probably could speak more to his pieces than, than I could because he's a musicologist. And, and I think he was taught by Hailstark. Uh, but anyway, uh, Eric, are you there? I am. He's back. Yeah. But I, but one of the things I <laughs> noticed about some of his pieces is that he always, like Lori says, he sneaks some, you can hear some of the Africanism, a uh, little bit of spiritual, and his, his pieces are very modernistic, but, but always there's an element of that included. 
think for him, he always has a um, celebratory section, and which I think is important for, you know, it's, I think one thing that I, I find on the islands is that, you know, uh, they'll begin a song. Now, when they end, it's up to them, but they'll begin a song, and it may go on and on and on, and that sense of improvisation, you know, and, and the idea that it's, you know, it's, I had to change my hearing for the Allen singer. I can no longer base it on what I perceive it as being tonal. I had to understand that this song was emanating from the soul, from that spirit. I couldn't put on, on, on paper. You hear everyone, the old, the, the old uh, song, uh, they, they always say, there's, there are tones that I can't find on the piano. It came from some other thing. And we've all heard singers that we don't know what that note was. It touched me. And that's something that I had to suddenly learn is those tones are not coming from anywhere but that spirit. And that's that's kind of I think intriguing for singers. Yeah, that's what I was wanting to ask you, Dr. Crawford, is um, those kinds of things. I was wondering what else you learned from listening and recording um, and being around um, generational singers that you didn't know before you started doing that work. Right, right. It, you know, it's, it's sort of the ethnomusicological thing of, uh, um, you know, it's not simply going there and then, you know, I would say in someone's backyard in a little small trailer. And I have the best hearing of them when they were cooking shrimp or or the ninth year old man um, with his cows and bulls saying that simply an isolated performance. It was part of the breathing, of the of the uh, walking, of the talking. And that's when you see, okay, now I understand why um, uh, every time I feel the spirit is a slow song, not not a fast song. Every time I feel, and so that it gets context to me. That was a um, revelation. Very good. Yeah. Um. Uh, I was. Uh, I've been noticing that we've been interchanging slave songs or work songs or spirituals, kind of the terminology. And I wonder if we all agree. If, are you all thinking that way that those are interchangeable terms? Or are there differences between those categories? Or are they categories? Or are well, they generic? I think, well, the, split, the the work songs come first. I think the work songs come first and the spirituals come after that. Because the work songs were, were those are uh, songs, those are compositions that our ancestors had in the West of Africa. And it's still a part of the culture there. I had the opportunity to go to Africa, the West of Africa, four different times. And every time I went there, it was amazing to see exactly how much we still are able to retain today. Um, although a lot was actually extrapolated, but uh, but some of that still um, resonates with, with uh, us where we are. Like for instance, where I'm from in South Carolina, singing in parallel fourths or parallel fifths um, is not unheard of. And so in the West of Africa, when I heard this the first time, I thought, wow, this is so very interesting. But these are, they would use these songs that I, I witnessed this there, where they would be out in the field or in the, in the post office or just name a place and they would be singing these songs. And then um, th those things were brought here. Now we know that we were all intermixed. And so everyone didn't speak the same language, but eventually we began to speak the same language. And um, and it comes, all of it derives from the, um, the work songs. The work songs yield the uh, spiritual and then spiritual, the blues, so forth and so on. I don't know what um, what Eric would say about this, but I, I, I would say that in general, I mean, these songs emanated from these slaves. And I think in, in, in general, many of them were, were just called slave songs. You know, I think we've come up with this after the fact, this this term spirituals. And uh, so they, they were slave songs, but there were specific songs for work. So they, they would be a, a, a separate category, work songs. And then there were some play songs as well. 
and uh, some of us grew up with some of those play songs but uh, uh just in general they were the songs of of these enslaved people and and uh when that that first book of spirituals was published that eric talked about last night i think bianca and i mentioned it today the one by lucy uh, kim and uh where um they just called them the slave songs of 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 the United States or slave song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And to add on to what has been said, um, if you think about the functionality, we talk about that with African song, like you have music for purposes, for what they call life cycles, like for births, deaths, um, royal courts, like so music interchanges is mixed in with your everyday life so when you think about that what are the things that you do daily like i can remember my grandmother she hums or she sings while she's cooking so all of it just fits in with what you do every day and also very importantly music fits along it's meant to be um performed together so the idea of community song is really important when we talk about not only spirituals, but just different types of singing throughout the day. I think maybe part of the problem is the term spiritual is often um, equated with sacred as far as something of religious significance. And when I think spiritual, that's what I'm thinking of is the religious themed songs, but maybe that's a wrong way of thinking about it. And I wonder um, if that component of faith or it being a worship song is, um, important or um, how, do, how do you approach that um, with your students when you're working with students with that? I um, just wondered if anybody had ideas about the incorporation of faith. Yes, um, right, because there, there's a, a large co um, corpus of, of play songs. In fact, the um, um, uh, Dai Institute has transcribed probably 30 or 40 Seattle and songs that were just simply a yeah, play song. And so that's, that's a big um, amount and even more exists. Um, and so I think that's important that they're more than just a sacred. I recall my, my dissertation title was going to be Negro Spirituals, the Sacred Repertoire. And my advisor said, oh, aren't they all sacred? <laughs> I said, no, they're not. But anyway, but so it was the idea that yeah, they are they are sacred and and are secular. But they, as as has been stated, they all have a purpose still. It was a, and if you sang a song out of context, that was an issue. Can you imagine if they were burying somebody on the plantation? Uh, this if if these enslaved people were burying one of their. Um, one of their fellow um, enslaved people. I mean, can you, I, I just wonder what kind of song they would have sung. I mean, I, I don't think they necessarily would have sung a work song. They, but but like Bianca was saying, it they fit the function or the the purpose of uh -huh. you know if they were burying somebody. It, it was work involved in digging a grave and putting the person in it, but also there was this sacredness about it as well and sadness about it. And so uh, a lot of elements come together uh, and in, in these songs, it's, it's just inescapable that a lot of elements come together. At the end of my, end of my book, um, which comes out in July, I have the ending song book in which the sacred spirituals are categorized according to their liturgical functions. Because I would hear on the last baptismal song, it's a song for seeking, it's a song for um, shouting. And so clearly having these defined categories is, is important because we tend to think that the slaves just, just you know, half um, hazardly would have a song here or that, that the service wasn't very exact and, and organized. And I think it's important to kind of understand that. Even to this day, they'll say no. We we'll do the song for that occasion, and and for someone dying, Rick, if or or for death, they would do the shout. Out would oftentimes reconnect to that circle. I think Is we lost the last part of what you said, Doctor. Oh, Cooper. I said and for, and for and for death, we would oftentimes do that shout because the shout would reconnect to that circle. 
Yeah. And so oftentimes as the body was going down into the ground, they would then circle around and throw dirt into grave. Hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And I remember my grandmother telling me that when women were delivering babies, you would have other women who would be moaning or humming, you know, in, in the background because they believed that death circled you seven times yes. during that particular process. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, and so they were they would be there and and to help to use that to ward off, if you will, death from coming in. Yeah, maybe um, all the times be passed under the um, coffin of, of someone. Yeah, taking like that spirit from that uh, from going into. The yeah, death. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, yep. So are we agreeing their category? <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> i would normally use uh the term spiritual for the what came later and was arranged um if it's in its uh pure form like i keep saying i kind of refer to those as slave songs and then the one that the ones that are more secular i would i call plantation songs so um that, but i'm you know i'm not writing any books on the matter so uh yeah it's kind of yeah, they seem interchangeable, but uh, I think the term spiritual is usually, you know, for what's coming later, but yes, uh, of a sacred text. And they it's, also, it's, oh, go ahead. Me, I was just going to comment that it seems that they're often group related that you're talking about group songs versus an individual solo kind of song too. But I think part of my problem with the categorizing too is just my constructs of how I think of things in my my way of thinking and living um and that that can always um equally translate to a different culture and that makes sense go ahead dr uh, professor gardner I, I was just going to say that um that it's interesting that uh i think i think it was uh, frederick Douglass who wrote uh, about spirituals and the fact that uh, uh many particular felt that the singing of spirituals was evidence that uh, that enslaved people were were uh, content and having a wonderful time in their their condition because of the beauty of these pieces and the and the uh, and you know how they uh, sang them with fervor and even a, a sense of joy, even though their joy oftentimes was mistaken because it was deep sorrow that they were expressing. Uh, through through their singing, but it's interesting that that they were misread as you know they're having a wonderful time, you know, out there in the fields. And that's one of the things that I make sure that my students uh, um, understand about the the spirituals. Again, I happen to teach at a non HBCU. And so whenever I give them this, and, and it seems you know wonderful or happy or something like this, remember the context is that you have seen a body hanging from a tree, or your brother has been sold, or your mother has been raped mm, you know, before your yeah. presence or something like this. And so those that's the re, that's the reality behind, I mean, just all of this that you're actually you're experiencing. And so, you know, uh, one, one, uh, among my the favorites are uh, of the spiritual is are sometimes I feel like a motherless child. And I, I frequently, I'll give this to a student and say, what do you think this is about? Because I, I don't necessarily have an answer in, in my mind or the, in my head, but I'm just interested to know what they're thinking about. And so I, sometimes I get some, some pretty, you know, profound answers, and sometimes the answers are less profound. But I like to get them to thinking about it because this, these songs are spiritual comes from an experience and that That's people right. actually live through. That's and right. so when you when you sing it like it's as you know, every time I feel the spirit, just name something. Couldn't hear nobody pray. Mm -hmm. Way down down the by myself, couldn't hear nobody pray. So I mean that that would have meant something to the individual. Of course, it was all this was communal, but sometimes, you know, there you there was the only way that you could communicate on the plantation without saying, P.S., we're going to be leaving tonight. <laughs> you know, you know yeah. these, these songs were a way of their making sense of their, their condition and their life. Uh, yes. And elevating. It's the power yes. that music yes. had to be able to elevate them beyond uh -huh. 
there is. And, and they could share the pain through singing. They could share the joy through singing. And so it was a communal thing that they could share with each other to help lift their the burden of what they were living through. Yes. Yeah. I especially like what you all are saying, like Dr. Hicks just said about elevating and Professor Gardner, because even the perception of these songs themselves, they had to go from not everyone understood what they were hearing. These were not always like appreciated. And so the idea of taking them and using them through these different mediums and art forms and like the synthesis of like what was considered one of the lowest art forms with what was considered one of the highest art forms, it really is amazing. Um, everything that's been able to be accomplished with the spirituals because everyone did not appreciate spirituals and they weren't all proud of spirituals. You make a good point because um, I was just reading in uh, uh, Dark Midnight When I Rise that, that mm -hmm. the story of the, uh, yes. of the Fist Jubilee singers and one of the singers interviewed, I think her name is Ella Harper, I think it is, and she talked about how she would hear her parents and grandparents sing those songs. And they were they were kind of ashamed. You got you have it. <laughs> yeah. uh, and she they were kind of ashamed of or or they felt like that was for their parents. Sure. That yep. was their story. And they were, she said they would never have thought or never have believed that they would go out and sing these songs to, to the public because this was a private kind of sorrow. And, and I think even in our uh, c uh, American society for many years, a lot, of, a lot of particularly elite people didn't want to hear these uh, slave songs or spirituals, whatever you would, would call them, because it, it reminded them of something they wanted to forget. And, uh, and Ella Harper says that it, when they got to Europe, and they were told by by their conductor that you, if if you don't do these things well, you're going to be judged as being less than that you, less than human. And so they they she said that when they got out there on that stage and sang "Still Away," it was just, you know, you couldn't hear breathing in the room. It was so moving and touching. And so she said from then on they felt the need to go out and sing these things. And that's what started that tradition of singing it with the European tone, because yeah. the Jubilee singers were presenting them to European audiences and, yes. and white audiences. So in order to be accepted, in order to be taken seriously, and like he's just said, not to be uh, seen less than, and to separate it from the menstrual stages, where that's where they were using spirituals to mock the culture. Um, yeah, it that's what started that and elevated it to this high art. And then you got the solo spiritual and you have the the opera singers that, you know, used it in their repertoire as well. So that's what brought it uh, out of that, off the plantation into the concert stage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also keeping in mind that when the Borshak came to America to be the, the president of the American Conservatory, um, uh, H.T. Burley was there. And so Burley was the one who introduced him to the spiritual. And so, um, and but he's brought here because the American composers want to develop their own style. And, and so the workshop was saying, well, you have the music of the, the Negroes and you have the music of the natives. So what's the problem? You have your own, uh, these, these uh, wonderful resources here, but they were rejected. But um, I actually have a couple of, uh, spirituals that Dvorak actually translated into Czech and took back um, with him when he went yeah. home. I was at a Nats conference, imagine that. And I was just looking through the bin and, and I saw, I said, oops, this is mine. <laughs> so I did, but anyway, um, but, uh, but I think even then in the, at the uh, turn of the century, 19th uh, into the 20th century, Dvorak was trying to get the ball rolling. And so eventually it began to roll, but um, it was very slow in coming. Yeah, and of course, that's part of the Ninth Symphony, the New we World Symphony. We also forget that the, the first, uh, the person who conducted many, the, I believe the uh, the conductor of the uh, Fist Jubilee Singers, the first one was a white man. And oh, yeah. Hampton University Music Department was started by, by, uh, by a white man. Many of these 
um, many of these um, HBCUs, their music departments were run by whites. And so that's another reason for the European uh, uh, proclivity, if you will. And then the other thing is that Burley and many of the early uh, arrangers of spirituals were all uh, trained at conservatories at the, around the turn of the century, uh, uh, like Tommy Watson was just saying, around the turn of the century, they all went to these conservatories when uh, these, there were a few that would allow blacks to come to the, Oberlin was one of the first ones. And, uh, and there were others in New York and, and other places. I would note that the um, traditional uh, spiritual uh, was called again in the sixties for the for rights movement when it had to be that plain song, that song that spoke of blessed assurance of a better day and that fight for freedom, that they again went back to plantation again. Right. Years later. That's right. Well, simplicity, somebody talked about that earlier. Simplicity, simplicity. You go back to the simple roots of, of, of things and you can't go wrong, I believe. I want to, can I jump in for a second and make a comment? Um, when I was a freshman at Oberlin Conservatory, Moses Hogan was actually a senior. So I'm so proud that I was actually. <laughs> and and I, I listened to a, a panel discussion recently, a couple of weeks ago, about Moses Hogan's spirituals and his music. And they talked about how we need to move them up in the program. They don't just need to be the last thing on the program every time. That that's um, an important thing. Just wanted to stick that in there. You know that's a, that's a <laughs> Thank old you. tradition. I think was it was it yeah. Marian Anderson who started that tradition of ending her recitals always with with spiritual. Be. It, and it was a way of elevating the, yeah. the race uh, to include uh, uh, this, the contribution musical contribution of African Americans on these these European with these European forms and so. That's, that's why, but I, I think it's yeah. a wonderful tradition. I, I do. Yeah. I'm, I'm we can for moving them, them up too, over. Diana. Uh, I'm yeah, for moving yeah. them up. I, and I'm for moving them up too. I, I would say that. We but you know in, what? In, in, I, I, you know, there's something, and the performers have to speak to this. There's something about getting through these French songs and these German songs, Italian <laughs> songs, and then being able to let your hair down. And, right. And, and, and just let it. Let it go. Mm -hmm. I, there's something wonderful about that. Well, it's hard to follow it, too. Sometimes that's uh -huh. the issue. It's uh -huh. so exciting uh -huh. to follow. Uh -huh. uh, I'm fascinated by this, and I'm wondering uh, if we want to speak a little more about sharing of music and the importance. Uh, beforehand, we were talking about empathy and when you learn the music of people's culture and ownership, you know, who owns music? Does anyone own music as, uh, but also balancing that with um, respect for the traditions of the past. Um, and Dr. Jackson, I think you brought up in the talk that uh, that you gave earlier about ownership and finding an authentic voice so that you can relate to this. And Dr. G or Mr. Gardner, you said that as well. Um, can we speak about that, about the empathy and sharing of music and ownership and balancing that with um, not doing things that maybe aren't right for you. Mm, yes, definitely. I can just say from my personal experience that, you know, as a black person, as a black woman, these spirituals are just about synonymous with like who I am as a person. So it, it, it connects with me on such a deep level that I don't even have to think about it. But when I am performing music that maybe is not from my culture, I make sure that I am well educated or as well educated as I can be on what it is that I am performing. I've spent years studying opera arias, years studying Bach, Beethoven, whoever the composer is. I've, I've dedicated years to that study. And I just recommend that the same amount of research and respect is given to spirituals for someone who wants to study spirituals. You need to study where these songs came from. As we've said, it's not always a happy story. It's actually a very terrifying story if you get into the particulars of some of the like atrocities that happened during slavery. So if you are gonna be 
courageous enough to approach the full picture or as full of a picture as we can get because we can mm -hmm. never fully or I can only speak for myself I can never fully understand what slavery was for a person who was enslaved but I try to get as much understanding and connect my own personal story to what it is that I'm performing so that I can give an authentic picture of what it is when I do that I have to know that everyone won't agree with what I am doing Everyone may not agree with me singing an opera aria, but I feel the aria deep in my soul, just like I, I feel the spiritual. So I feel like that I'm bringing an authentic expression of what the music is to me. So I make the choice to be brave enough and respectful enough to approach the music from an authentic place and just really hope that the people out there can connect with what I'm doing, but be open to also criticism that may come. Um, as we answer this, I see that Beth Lenart, sorry, Beth, I see you just asked a very similar question about that. Are there songs that you should leave alone? She says, like Undine Moore's um, Watch and Pray, for example. I, I personally don't know of a song that some, somebody should leave alone. I, I Somebody else would have to answer that. I, I just don't, I'm not aware no, of that's the one that is Massa going to sell us tomorrow. And, oh, and no. I, yeah, I've been now, maybe that in one. discussions. <laughs> yeah, I've been in several I, I, discussions I, I, where, yeah, there are some, if you kind of get into that context, it, it, and, and leaving it alone out of, you know, respect and, and not to strike a, a nerve or, um, but it, there's still art songs. So again, still approach it with if if you feel like you can be authentic in that or if it's going to be too uncomfortable or too uncomfortable for your audience then certain things like that i would say to kind of steer clear from but there are so many that don't get that specific into um how it would have been as a slave but it, it, i think it's still open up for interpretation as long as that research is done um, there are tons of books, you can't see behind me, but there are tons of books and, and resources and, and um, autobiographies and biographies of composers and as well as um, we were just talking about the Black Church uh, documentary on on PBS documentary of Marian Anderson they talk about spirituals there um, and really when you when you're starting to get into some of those documentaries then you see how the spiritual is relevant throughout the black experience and you can continue to get into that context of what that song means and how it means throughout the generations and then also translate it to what it can mean to me because just like she was saying you none of us were slaves and yes it is a part of our musical culture but we've never been oppressed to that extent that they that they were so it is still an interpretation and putting yourself in the context of in the mindset you know i was never a German, a, a gypsy in Germany, but I'm still going to sing, you know, the Tegwena leader. It, it, we have to take the time to put ourselves in that mindset so we can communicate authentically. And it's just the same thing. Like I like to say, it's in our song, Boo Boo. So it's just the same thing. Take the time to understand what you're trying to communicate, what the intent of the composer, what the intent of the melody and the words were, and then how you're going to, um, to interpret that and communicate it it's the same thing so but you know now that i think of it there uh, there there are songs that i wouldn't do i i not they wouldn't be considered spiritual but even the uh, state song of virginia carry me back to old virginia that's where the cotton and the corn and taters grow that's where the old the darkies uh, it talks about darkies and also i i don't know the beautiful song without a song by vincent Uman. right I, Thing that but one of the lines in it is a dark is born and so you know when when i was in school my teacher taught me that but you change the word to a fellow's born or something like that right. you change those words and you know but you do have to be you know i wouldn't want anybody to come in here and sing old black joe or something like yeah. that it might be offensive. But i think also too we have to remember and i think one of the, the reasons why we don't advance as a country is because we don't make the time to acknowledge that and not only egregious, a heinous thing happened. There was nothing beautiful about enslavement. There's right. nothing beautiful about the experience. 
And so there are going to be a number of songs that you're going to hear, like Mama is Massa going to sell us tomorrow. I actually gave it to one of my students and she sang it and she cried because she said, I couldn't, I can't. She, she says, what is this? I said, you tell me. You tell me. I think sometimes, we, and again, just so that there is no trouble, we don't like to talk about these kinds of things. And there are some spiritual out there that really actually make you think. And that's what they're supposed to do. So and don't, so, don't shy like, away from so the we, just, we just want to only see the things that are politically correct. It's going to make people not feel uncomfortable in the audience. You know, I love the, the, um, uh, the, the dream portraits. I, 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 where I work, I have to see those about every two years or every three years because it was because somehow we seem to, to regress. Some, somehow we seem to regress. And so I have to pull those out every about every two years, I do. And, you and so we cannot, we cannot uh, again, we can't run away from the right. fact that somebody, it, it, from the brutality of that, of that institution. Right. And so, so I, for me personally, I think it would be powerful for a white man to stand on stage and sing, Mama, is Massa going to sell us tomorrow? Because that was a person who was in, con in control of everything. I would love to see that. I would personally love to see that and see what that experience is and what that thought process is for that particular person. And, 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 and also, unless people are getting that uncomfortable with it, I mean, when you think about, you know, what is the Valkyrie? What, what is it, Zeglinda and, and her brother are getting it on? Okay, you have to think about incest there. Okay, yeah. And so that's not necessarily comfortable to talk about incest. But this also is a part of it too. Everything is not every time I feel the spirit, okay? Everything is not, you know, amen, you know, let the church say amen. Everything is not that. Sometimes you feel like a motherless child. Lord, listen, how come me here? Why come me here? I wish I never was born. I mean, when you stop to think about that, a person literally says, I wish I never was born because my reality is so brutal. It's so indescribable that I wish that I was never born. And so we need uh, we need that comprehensive kind of experience. It's kind of like singing wolf. I don't, you know, don't sing wolf in the winter, okay? <laughs> Unless you are on all of your meds, okay? Because it's depressing, okay, right? Yes, okay, you can't miss any meds in the, in the winter when you, if you're singing, you have to sing wolf, but wolf is heavy. Oh, yes. so some of these are not all wolf is heavy, but uh, some of it is like really, you know, I've sat and, and eaten my bread with my tears. And you, and you say, oh my God, said, this is like a spiritual, but just a different context, you know. But, but again, it's very, very different, you know, kind of thing. But again, we, we tend to run away from the ugly, and that is why we never move forward. It is ugly. And you we really cannot. Cannot neg neglect to uh, acknowledge that. You remind me of a of, of an instance where some years ago I sang "Lord, how, how come me here?" Which Kathleen Battle has made that famous as one of her signature pieces. "Lord, how, how come me here?" I wish I had never been born. I sang that in Greece, and the people asked me. It it obviously. Um, disturbed the people so much that they asked me to sing Amazing Grace afterwards and because they were so disturbed by by the words of that and and which I did but uh it, it that kind of shocked me I was the only black person in this uh venue and so uh that was an experience that I had they did I think they didn't want to deal with the, the the pain of of that and the ugly things. Nobody you know. wants to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. that's one of the things that go around this cycle. No one wants to deal with it. It's ugly. It's that yeah. ugly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a 71 year old white woman married to a man who grew up in Africa as a missionary kid in Yoruba land in Nigeria. Hmm. And yeah. I have always um, loved spiritual. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I have to always apologize to people for my race. I hate it. I hate what we did. But I resonated with the spirituals because I'm a serious Christian. And what it was showing me was, well, we look not at the things which you're seeing, 
but the things which are not seen. But the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And I thought, they were doing it. And the, they were doing it, and they were overcoming, and we can overcome a whole lot more. Uh, you know, the, um, Preach. And, and, Preach now. That's right. Well, well, listen, I, 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 I've got, already got arranged that I'm going to have right on King Jesus at my funeral. All it right. is my absolute favorite. Now, it's All along right. with a Bach um, um, a duet. <laughs> All but, right. you know, hey. Good programming. Good programming. <laughs> uh -huh. so, but uh, thank you for for uh, preserving and letting us know because I was afraid to do. Um, I did uh, as uh, like right on King Jesus as Paul Johnson wrote it, which was a little dialectical, you know. But and then somebody said you shouldn't do that because you're not black, and I thought, well, were I, they black? I, I, yeah, oh. and and you know, uh, I don't know, I. I I have a children's choir too. We always do musical, I, I know, if it's spirituals. And I said, guys, I know I look white, but somewhere in here I am black. <laughs> and my my son uh, uh, sent me 23 and me, and it says, Mama, you are, because I, I would say, I know there's somebody black in my heritage. I hope there is. And he said, Mom, no, you, all you had was, was uh, it's straight. Um, Anglo-Saxon and one Cherokee princess. <laughs> so, but in my heart, that that these were written by my brothers and sisters who were going through it because of my race, and they could see a God who could pull them higher, going up higher, and seeing something better, and um, and being encouraged. So. Thank you for, for giving us more and more information. And I, I feel like I have some new friends. <laughs> and I, I challenge everyone, you know, if you're wanting to do spirituals, we seek out coaches for our arias and art songs. Uh, reach out to uh, someone you think could help coach you through the dialect and all of that. I think the idea of singing in dialect has, has uh, evolved um and because i don't think i just do, i don't think it's stylistic to do it in the king's english but right. especially right. when it's it's written in dialect but um yeah seek out help seek out uh, a coach and someone who can like i said help guide uh you in your interpretation do the dialect if it's there do it you know, we yeah. see neapolitan all the time you know i mean <laughs> hello so if it's there do it and it's just uh, sometimes I have people been. think, for yeah, it, it should be. If Mozart wrote something, we, that's how we're going to perform it. And if the, if the if Laurie wrote something, then that's how we're going to perform it. And just 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 how that is. And so no one should feel anything because you're not mocking anyone. I think that the fear is that you're going you're trying to mock people. I think about uh, Zora Neale Hurston when she actually recorded, you know, uh, someone who had been enslaved and. Um, and and uh, she shared those recordings with someone. They said, "Oh, you can't, you can't, you can put this in writing, you know, because it wasn't seen as being acceptable." But mm -hmm. that's what it was. Mm -hmm. You know, I I love my home every once in a while because I forget some things that you know because I I don't live there anymore. And so all the expressions that you hear, I love it. Every once in a while, I go back and spend a week, and and I, I get tickled every day by what I'm hearing and the, and the beauty of it, because it, you know it's been passed on. Yeah. And so for the, my home church, you know, we started out in the, in the brush arbor, literally. So we were back out in the woods and then we, we, we met on that canopy. And then eventually we were able to uh, purchase land and build the church. And our church is the oldest church in the Columbia uh, district, the Amy yeah. Church District. So when you come back from these trips, do people say, I know you, I can tell you've been on. <laughs> yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But people who are my, my, my inner circle say, you went home this weekend, right? I will certainly be. I love it, though. I, I really, really do. Yeah, do the dialect. Absolutely. You find a coach, find someone who can help you through that. Again, it's just about being you know, respectful of, of the text. And again, you approach it the same way you would do Strauss. If you were singing a Strauss aria or uh, art song, the same thing. It's an art song. If you bring sincerity and presence to what you're doing, that's what matters. People get it. Who, what is that? 
What you the got there, Dr. Shiel Bibbs, the art of the spiritual. She talks oh, about okay. dialect. I, yes. Oh, I have to get that. Is way over in Beulah land. He talks about yes. dialect as well so there are resources call me email me <laughs> all right <laughs> I think Beth raising her hand again oh okay great yeah i just wanted to say that i was in a conversation about a performance that had not been very physical or very committed it didn't feel very real and it was a, some spirituals and i just said to the person that i bumped into you know, singing a spiritual is like having a baby. You got to tear some tissue. And she popped me on the arm and said, yeah, honey, you got to get ugly before the Lord. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so that's what I tell my students. You know, if you're not ready to get ugly before the Lord, you're not really singing this. Well, yes. but you know what, what that sounds like is you have to strip yourself bare. I mean, and that not that what artistry is about? It's really about stripping yourself bare. And, and uh, they were definitely there. Yeah. Yeah, you've yeah. got to be brave. I think people are be afraid brave. to be embarrassed, yeah. you know, especially when people can film you at any second and then that gets goes viral or something that I really think that's a legitimate concern for a lot of people, um, especially student age, that they're worried about the embarrassing moment and afraid of the discomfort. So I really love that you talked about pushing yourself into the discomfort and really digging into it because that's a sign of respect and something that we should all be working for. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation and I just greatly appreciate your time so much today. Everybody was speaking wonderful truths and um, I know I'm going to be thinking about it for a long time coming. Um, so I want to thank everybody who came to uh, listen and ask questions as well too. But let's give it up for our panelists today. And uh, we thank you all for your time and be sure to check them out. Their bios are online. Um, the, um, you'll want to see all of the cool things they're doing. I think Dr. Hicks is getting ready to do a presentation pretty soon. And Dr. Crawford is writing a book, right? Um, all sorts of um, details coming up. So please follow them on social media or wherever it is to go to their websites and support them too, because that's really important to make sure that we support wonderful ed education like this. So thank you all truly very much. We really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank you. For this conversation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. This was wonderful. It was. And good to meet you, the, whom I have not met. <laughs> I like Tommy exactly. Watson. I don't think we've ever met. <laughs> Likewise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Don't lay down my burden. All right. Not stay spiritual. We got to have music. That's right. You can't talk about spirituals and not sing something. We got to line up. Yeah. <laughs> <It's inside. laughs> right. Excellent. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.